I'm going to talk today about a project that I uh, find extremely satisfying. It's a journalism project, but it all started with a tragedy. Uh, this is Jan Kuciak. He was my good friend and a colleague. Uh, he was murdered 21st of February 2018. And because we didn't believe that um, the police would be able to discover who did it and how it happened, we started our own investigation as well. Uh, okay. So what we did, right after the murder happened and the information became public, what was a couple of days later, we sent something we called emergency team to collect as much of the data as possible. Uh, I was not able to attend, I was living under police protection because of the story we worked together uh, and, and which was the main lead at the beginning uh, of who may be the one who ordered the murder, the assassination. Uh, but my colleagues went uh, and they have collected 24 terabytes of data. It's a lot. Uh, mostly it was CCTV footage from the small town when Jano used to live. Um, and they brought it back home. And now we had 24 terabytes of a CCTV footage that we actually knew that most probably the perpetrators would be somewhere there in 24 terabytes. Just to compare, if you know Panama Project, Panama Papers project, it had four terabytes. So right from the beginning, we had much more. So uh, apart from CCTV footage, those were just the small hints uh, that they were able to collect because mostly the people who knew something, what happened and how, um, were living under police protection or uh, collapsed like the, the families of Jano and Martina. Jano Kuciak was uh, murdered together with his fiance Martina. So my colleagues brought home 24 terabytes of data on uh, about four or five uh, external hard drives. So what we, we did a little brainstorm what to do with it. Unfortunately, uh, we had, or maybe unfortunately, we had already experienced uh, with investigation of assassination of our colleague. The first colleague, when we actually developed the, the procedures and the skills, how to do it, how to investigate it, was a uh, journalist from Ukraine, Pavel Sheremet, who was uh, killed by a car bomb. So we just talked and we, we actually did copy-paste of the system uh, we did in his case. Uh, so, what we did. We actually went back to Velka Macha, what is the town when Jano was murdered and we, where he used to live. And we went through all the streets, just taking pictures, where are, what are the positions of the cameras in the town. Uh, those are just a couple of them, and you need to uh, give them numbers and actually a short description where, the, where are those cameras. You can see on the right side, that there's football field, house, where Jano was murdered, uh, and other notes that we took, because we considered those points super important for our own investigation. But it didn't really help. So what we did next was that we created a map where actually we knew what are the positions of the camps, but we didn't know what are the directions that the camps are aiming at. So we went back and created uh, our own map with the locations of the cameras and where what, what actually are they shooting. This wouldn't be helpful <laughs> either because you don't really know what's going on. So we went back and took the photos, what each of the cam can see. And the photos look like this. You know, it, it's not really revealing or special or 
saying anything, but we needed those pictures extremely because what we needed to do is to find those places. This is how the CCTV footage from those days looked like. And if you just receive this 24 terabytes of such a footage, then you have no idea what you are looking at. Because, at least me, I've never been there. I don't know which cam it is, where is it positioned, if, it, if, if this angle and this street would be helpful or not. You are just watching and watching. So, we've got the cameras sorted. We were able to place them, we were able to, to actually check only the cams that we should be interested in. And that's what we, that's how we started. But then, uh, you know, those were days and nights of CCTV footage and we didn't actually have so much time to go through all of it. So, uh, we were trying the new approach how to sort it because we are not able you know it's like you, you you are really watching for hours empty street and then one car is coming like here at the top of the picture and you can guess it's a black car okay you can guess it's uh, probably going this direction but that's it it's not when it's a it's a personal car but what to do with this kind of information we do be able to spot that this car was, you know, doing something special. Could this car be the one that the, the assassins throw to the house of Jano? Probably not. So, we asked our colleague from Kyrgyzstan, who offered his help in using artificial intelligence on sorting and taking out of the 24 terabytes of a footage just, you know, the, the, the frames. Where are the cars? And actually uh, putting it in, into special folder, but also saying what time was it and which cam was it, and you know, a couple of frames before and a couple of frames after. So he created, he started to build this neural network that would actually be able to spot to 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 save our time and and human power, and to um, create neural network that can recognize the cars and make uh, pictures of the cars where hopefully we would be able to see the license plates of the car and where we will be able to see, you know, what kind of a car it was. We got into a problem, you know, it was not the, 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 the building of the neural network and the results, it was not faster than actually watching the footage yourself. So, uh, it didn't really help because we were kind of in a hurry. So we were trying to find different approaches. But in the meantime, the project developed. Also, the investigation of the police developed. Uh, six months after, when we were like, you know, trying to sort out at least the days and hours around the assassination, there was no police progress, at least not official, not public. No one knew if there is still the investigation, police investigation into the murder, if there is anything new. Uh, I didn't trust the police because they uh, took me twice for I thought it, it's, it's going to be witness testimony, but it was rather interrogation. During the, the first interrogation, they asked me things that they can Google in five minutes. Uh, how tall was Jano Kuciak? You know, how, how long did they knew Miss Martina each other? If I've ever met her, if I know him. They didn't ask a single question about the work we've done together. Uh, what was kind of weird, you know. Um, by then, I was living under police protection, what meant that for the interrogation, I was put into the helicopter in a bulletproof vest. Four other people with me, heavily uh, armed, uh, they put a helmet on my head and we flew actually by helicopter from Prague to Bratislava, what is about 300 kilometers. And then I went to the interrogation and they asked me those questions that they can actually find on Google. 
So then we made the whole circus back again. They put me into the helicopter and flew me back to Prague. And I was like, what was it? So they didn't gain my trust. But next time they said, OK, now we actually got into some of the leads and we need you back for witness testimony. Could you come again to Bratislava? So I was still by then living under police protection. This time we went by cars, what is kind of a tricky because I needed to be handed over at the borders. I'm a Czech citizen, I'm living in Czech Republic. I was going to give a, a witness testimony in Slovakia. So again, you know, um, it was quite complicated. They, ne they needed to close all the street when I was going out of the car and then. But this time, there were three guys, uh, three investigators who were asking me questions for seven hours. And at the end of the interrogation, they took my phone saying that it may contain information that I was involved in the assassination of Jano. What I later found out that yes, that the police by then had 32 leads of possible motives uh, of the assassination uh, on a scale of 1 to 32 from the most probable to the least probable. And I was number eight. Uh, so only later I've learned that it was not some kind of a joke when they took my phone, but they really believed that I killed Jano. Uh, as I said, there was no visi visible progress within those six months. Uh, so we didn't know if, if you know, if they are investigating at all. And what was the third critical point when we decided that there is no reason to trust the police investigation was actually the fact that they did a lot of really big mistakes directly at the crime scene, you know. Um, when they were discovered, when, when the bodies of Jano and Martina were discovered, uh, the police that came to the place believed that uh, it may be a gas leak. So they opened the windows. Then the emergency unit came and they just didn't know what happened. So they moved the bodies to see if those people are shut down or what actually happened. So when actually the proper investigators came to the police, to, to the crime scene, um, it was not how it should be. It was not like it was left by the perpetrators. Uh, also, they set the, the time of the assassination about three days wrong. So really, we, we were just like, what the hell is going on? Nevertheless, the police really progressed. And after nine months after the assassination, they uh, were able to find and arrest those guys who pulled the trigger and the guy who organized the murder. Uh, all of those guys uh, are in jail. They were sentenced. And uh, yeah, they are serving their terms in a prison now. So uh, it was positive, surprising, uh, great. And we were relieved, but we didn't get, the police didn't get and started uh, at the top of those three guys to investigate who ordered the assassination. Uh, even though the information were not public, after one year we were able to actually reconstruct uh, how the assassination happened. We've published it on OCCR, we, OCCRP website with my colleague. Uh, we actually spent about a month uh, only talking to the families, talking to, to the witnesses, talking to the sources, being in Velkamacha, the town when Jano lived, uh, going through the emails and so on. And we were able to reconstruct what happened that night. Uh, but we didn't stop there. Let me just check how much time we have. Okay. So, that's what we've done after 12 months. Uh, and eight months after, we just got a source who had given us 70 terabytes of data. Um, it was complete 
file, police investigation file, including all the annexes. So we were actually now uh, handling 70 terabytes of data, what was like absolute overkill. You know, when I called my boss that we would need some technical help with this data, he said, yeah, 17, that's a lot, that's a lot. I said, no, it's 70, you know, we, we would need to buy a special servers, how to, how to deal with it and so on. Uh, that's how it looked like when we, when we actually started to move the data. And now about the data and the project. Uh, this is how it looked at the end after sorting all the data. Uh, what is important to say, when you get 70 terabytes of data, it's heavy, you know. You, you can actually move, it's easier to move a human being from place A to place B than 70 terabytes of data. I was carrying it from Zhishkov in Prague to our office that is downtown, and it had like 15 kilograms. It's like, we didn't expect it. We didn't include it in our calculations when we actually asked the guy from Berlin to, help, to come and help us with the technical solution that we would need to carry it in our backpacks. Uh, and of course, copying 70 terabytes of data takes a lot of time. We are talking about days, not hours. Uh, even if you are creative and, and uh, use Raspberry Pi on multiple levels so you can co copy more disks at the same time, it was a lot. Uh, then we needed to find out what to do with the data, because 70 terabytes of data, it's not in human power to go through it. And of course, we were pushed by the time. So we asked another member of our tech team if she can help us to sort it out. And she said, yes. So because it was police investigation, we've got full images of the computers, of the cell phones. We've got a lot of CCTV footage once again. We've got the BTS towers information. We've got uh, all kinds of data. Because those were full images of the computers and cell phones or any external hard drive, uh, there were empty spaces left. So we agreed that we can delete two things. The empty space, that we don't need you know, the, the full image of the device, including the empty space. And there was a lot of Hungarian porn, for some reason, from some computers uh, of those perpetrators. So we agreed that we can delete it as well. At the end, we have 55.3 terabytes of data. Uh, CCTV was about 27 terabytes, and then uh, images of hard drives, uh, USB, laptops, computers, all sorts of data, all sorts of formats. But it was kind of more positive to see it this way than what we've seen uh, when we first checked the, the, the annexes of the police investigation. Uh, and then my role started Unfortunately, today I was hoping Arpad Šoltes, a journalist and writer from Slovakia, could come as well. He couldn't. He's in France. Uh, we've got this 70 terabytes of data with my colleague from Slovakia, and we had a quite a debate what to do with the data. Because even if we would, you know, be the journalist, be the, you know, the, the, the proud journalist who, who wants to have exclusivity on this data and reveal new things from the data. Uh, we knew that it's not in our power to actually spend another seven years just going through the data. So we have come with idea that actually we need to kill our egos and give the information to the others. We will just get it ready, we will just process it, we will provide all the service needed, but we will give it to all journalists in Slovakia who we trust. So we have created a team of about 14 journalists from all major 
Slovak media, including TV station, including tabloid, what later proved really smart. Uh, and we give them access. We were really careful about how to do it because of security, because the data that were included in this uh, data set was super sensitive. And uh, the government by then probably understood that uh, if we will reveal what's in the data before elections, uh, they would probably fail. So there are a lot of ways that were trying to stop us uh, from revealing, from working on the data and revealing it. So for security reasons, we created one access room in Bratislava and gave access to accredited journalists from Slovak media. And uh, we agreed with ARPA that, you know, to, to create better collaboration environment, we are not going to publish any story from the data. We'll just give it to the others. So we created it, this access room where they have uh, access computers to access the data, and, uh, but not to carry it away. If they wanted to download something and carry it away, uh, they would use encrypted USBs where they can download the data and open it at home computer, but in case they would lose the, the USB, nothing will happen. Uh, and we need this to create our own tools as well. Uh, one of the main findings in the data was a cell phone of Marianne Kochner. Marianne Kochner, according to my opinion, not according to the opinion of, of, the, of the judges, uh, was the one who ordered the murder. Uh, he had three applications for encrypted communication, but for some reason, well, I know the reason, but, uh, you know, the police, but also then also us, we were able to decrypt the communication. Uh, it was because Marianne Kochner sent a message from the jail that his phone should be deleted. And those are the access data. Those are the access codes. He wrote it on a paper and just sent it out. And uh, the guy who was supposed to you know, uh, securely erase the cell phone, he gave it to the police, including the access data. Uh, but there were over 60,000 of the messages on a three mile alone. So we needed to create very simple tool how to read it, because uh, we wanted to read the conversations, not, you know, the timestamps and how it went. And we also created almost offline map when we were able to spot where the where the the phone was moving, and this really helped with our work. That started fifth January two thousand twenty. We started to publish first stories. Uh, what we created was is still probably the best investigative journalism team in Slovakia. Now it has about twelve people still. They are doing great job publishing stories. We have published about, I don't know, maybe 60 stories so far. Uh, the ruling party went. They didn't won after probably 15 years. They lose the, the, the elections. Uh, 13 judges were arrested. Uh, other judges at the top of it, like constitutional judge, were, you know, were, were uh, forced by the, by the tension and the, by the public pressure we created to, to resign. Uh, the police president had to resign. Uh, other police officers, high ranking, had to resign as well. Uh, Unfortunately, Marianne Kochner and the lady who was helping him to, to organize the murder, they were uh, set free. Uh, they can't be because they have other crimes. Uh, they committed other crimes as well, but they were absolved of the murder, uh, I think, months ago. Yeah, pr pretty much months ago. But we appealed and we are just, you know, uh, still working on the data to show the judges that actually those guys are really guilty. 
Okay, I'm done. Any questions? <laughs> Yeah, hi, uh, thanks for excellent work and a uh, uh, question. Why you just don't uh, publish data in the full, like make it public, I mean really public, put it in a, in a you know, server which is not hosted here or wh whatever. There are ways to make it really worldwide. Yeah, Why didn't you do it first of all, way? publishing 70 terabytes would be really expensive. We don't have we have manpower. We don't have the server power, and what what what's more, uh, there are really private uh, private things uh, that we don't want to be published of, of random bystanders. So we didn't want to release this kind of information. You know the 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 Trima conversation. It was leaked to the public. Everyone can read it. Who can read Slovak? Uh, but there were other about uh, health conditions and so on of people who were really just random bystanders in all the case. So we decided to to, to put it into the context and publish as a, as a journalistic work. Okay, any other? Uh, I have a question. So, firstly, this this was the most brave presentation we have <laughs> now. So, so uh, my question is um, because it's it's because you basically uh, destroy probably career of many people, a lot of politicians, a lot of like reputation of, of many people. Uh, probably people are interested in the fact if these people ever threaten you in some way. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And also, how, yes. how, how did you cope with, with this situation? Um, yeah, I, when I was coming here, um, I was, you know, just thinking about the threats. And uh, yes, of course, we are quite often um, present in, in the public discourses of politicians. Prime Minister told about me that I'm head of a conspiration that just wants to overthrow the government, that I am public enemy and doesn't really matter. I didn't really care because um, I don't yeah. I don't really care what, what he says about me. But I have actually to two stories when I am kind of a sorry of those who are sending the threats. The first one was when I received the first threat after publishing an uh, article on, on a real mafia, on a real Balkan organized crime. I have received a letter that was actually saying, we know where you live, uh, we hate you, we are going to do harm to you and so on. But I've sent the letter to a wrong address. I moved about a year before the, the, the letter was sent and it just came to the wrong address. So it took another three months before I've learned that I have a problem. And actually this is happening right now. Uh, we've published another hardcore mafia stories uh, on another Balkan criminal organization. And we know that they've sent us a letter, but we can't pick it up from the post office. So most probably if there is any threat or if there is any bullet or if there is any poison or whatever, it would be just mm, returned to the sender. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we tried, guys. <laughs> Hello. Uh, it's been really uh, interesting to hear uh, your investigation work. And I was just wondering if you are aware of um, what is happening right now behind the scenes about uh, taking down the deep state and the cabal by all the messages that are placed on the Q, the QAnon post and all the links and all this code work which is actually um, uh, playing out right now and probably also some mass arrests from some bad actors in the political world on a global scale actually. So, uh, To me this is very exciting times because I really like uh, that these deep staters are step by step exposed by 
the messaging board of the Q group? Uh, yes, I'm aware of it, but of course I would like to know more. I'm not really an expert on this. Some of my colleagues are really, especially in Romania, they are into it, but I am really not, not my, my mental capacity is not really uh, ready to dive deep into this topic. It's really amazing. <laughs> you should check it out. Sure. I'm afraid I hate to burst your bubble, but I've been paying attention to the QAnon phenomena since it came out a number of years ago. And I've come to the conclusion that it's actually an operation by uh, US intelligence to distract from otherwise legitimate efforts to take down the deep state. Uh, because it specifically seems to focus everyone's attention in areas where the deeps, where it's actually to the American deep state's advantage to have people's attention focused, and it focuses their attention away from areas where people are actively doing things against the, against the deep state. For example, we saw recently the trial of Julian Assange in London, the extradition trial was happening, and while the trial was ongoing, the QAnon messaging was not telling people to support Julian Assange and prevent him from being extradited, but specifically in German chat groups, the QAnon messaging was that extradition is good, Assange needs to go to the US because quote unquote unquote he will be safe there, uh, which is exactly what the American deep state wants people to think. Uh, and we've seen similar things uh, earlier in the QAnon phenomena where QAnon was saying that um, Julian Assange was no longer in charge of WikiLeaks, therefore people shouldn't trust WikiLeaks. That's what I understand. Um, but that, of course, isn't accurate. Uh, we know Assange was in London, is in London, uh, was, is on trial, uh, was on trial, and was in fact in control of WikiLeaks because he used the Bitcoin blockchain to prove uh, his ownership and control of the WikiLeaks donation address, which is actually a very interesting use of Bitcoin technology to do identity verification. Uh, so again, I would strongly advise caution where QAnon is concerned because it does appear there's a lot of evidence that something's seriously wrong there. My question for you is totally unrelated to QAnon. Um, right. Uh, is a bit more technical because I think you talked a lot about what you've done. I'm wondering if you can talk at all about either the technical security measures you used, maybe you didn't need any because the mobsters are very incompetent with sending the letter to the wrong address. But no, no, talk about we, we, we really... Um we had a good security people. It's not that mm -hmm. I would be expert on it, but um, uh, the uh, what, what was our biggest concern? Well, I don't know where are the servers with access to the data. We call the project FedCat. Uh, so if I'm going to talk about FedCat, th th those are the, the 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 data on the server somewhere. I don't know where, um, and we get access in the secure room through uh, Linux-based uh, laptop stations that were actually stripped of all any other devices. The only thing you can actually do there is to get remote access to the data, nothing else. You can't download anything on USB, you can't get uh, online apart to, to, to this data. Uh, it was hell, uh, usually the, the system failed when it didn't, you know, when there was no reason. Uh, we also had one train uh, guy always that we called librarian, who was there assisting the journalist in searching the data or if the system failed um, to, to fix it, to reboot it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's how we did it. Of course, we use encryption, we use VeraCrypt for the data. Uh, what is but what is impossible if you want to, to use VeraCrypt on 70 terabytes of the data, it slows, really slows down the process. So actually what happened is that someone took the data, the, the external hard drives, uh, somewhere, and I didn't know where, and just one person knows, uh, where the data are now based, and it's not me. Um, and this guy, he's quite experienced in, in security and privacy. So I have to trust him. 
Can you talk anything about um, measures you either used or if you can't talk about what you've used, what you would recommend others use uh, yeah. to protect your own privacy, uh, security uh, against these very powerful... Very yeah, powerful we voices. we have uh, our procedures at OCCRP. We have the things we have to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't follow them, uh, you can't actually work for OCCRP. But it must be balanced because we also work with journalists from uh, countries like Sudan or Somalia. So first of all, we use, sig we use Signal uh, as an instant messaging app on, on cell phones. We have full encryptions of our computers. Uh, about half of the people are on uh, Linux. The second half is on Macs. Uh, we encrypt whatever you share and we have our own software where we actually share the information online. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your answers. Uh, oh, another question. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that you provided the data to the tabloids and you one said tabloid. one tabloid and you said it was a good decision. So yes. I would like to ask why. Okay, the, there was a, this case that's really disgusting in Slovakia when actually um, the, the, there, is, there was a rehab for uh, drug addicted youngsters, but you can't really in Slovakia drug addicted youngster is anyone who actually had one joint uh, and They were actually bringing uh, to this rehab young people boys and girls under 15 years old and Those boys and girls were sexually abused there uh, we have strong suspicion that um, also, politicians from the ruling party were actually using uh, this rehab as a kind of a source for uh, good sex uh, of underage kids. And, uh, you know, when, when the scandal broke, when finally someone was able to, to escape and tell the story was going on there, uh, those were two girls. One was called Junkie, don't trust her. So nothing really happened, but the uh, the rehab lost the license to operate, so they were not able to, you know, uh, run the kids as usual. So, within this data, we found out that actually the same guys opened a new rehab in different place in Slovakia, and they are still doing it, and they are still running it. So, we sent a paparazzi to, to stay there and actually took pictures of the guys who were running the rehab, the new one, that those are the same old guys. And he was able to stay there, he knew exactly what to do, he took the pictures and we published the story. <laughs>